Shrine Punk, Deep City Archives, an original Toho audiobook by Megafrog. Chapter 1, Cliffside Breakout. Cities are animals. The modern metropolis functions on strict rules that millions upon millions of tiny living creatures must all follow in hopes to survive. When one of those creatures ceases to function, it perishes, and it is swept away from the biological avenues it once walked. In the rare case that a rogue cell persists, it becomes something far more dangerous. Viruses, cancers, and infections course through the asphalt veins of Deep City. When these plagues threaten the health of the city, natural defenses must take action. Just as the brain sends chemical instructions to the immune system, so too does the mind of Deep City send a wire of credits to an anonymous bank account. Play the tapes. A flicker of scan lines and static bathe the room in a harsh analog light. The haze of slow-rising smoke glows the same blue as the exhaust of yesterday's engines. A woman in loose, casual clothing slowly swishes a crystal tumbler of rich orange scotch. A bulky glass and aluminum tube begins flashing through blurry security footage. Boss got us a job from the pinsuits. A raspy tone and a plume of smoke emerge from the chair opposite her. The seated figure rapidly mashed the buttons of a television remote as she spoke. One of Yaska's factories in the cliffs is having a mysterious breakout. Some kind of influenza. Looks like it's already put a good chunk of her workforce in bed. If it keeps going, they may have to shut down the plant. A dash of whiskey poured across her lips as she pondered her response. What, do they think I've got magic healing powers or something? Why'd they give us this job? The figure spewed out a smoky chuckle and gave a taunting reply. Even as the prime shrine maiden of Gensokyo, no one ever took you for the healing type. You wouldn't have made it if it wasn't for me dropping my store profits in your donation box. Yeah, yeah, hush it. Now tell me why you want us to take a corporate job. Take a look at this. Marissa picked the remote back up and switched the monitor from the tape footage to her personal computer. A medical diagram of a man's neck filled the screen. Right here. Injection marks. 18 gauge by the looks of it. Every victim so far has been found with these marks on them, mostly on the neck and forearm. None of the workers can recall where they got them. Raymond's eyes wiped over the images. Well, that's not a likely jab spot for smear or heroin. The slightest jitter and you're bleeding out on the pavement. Not that it hasn't happened before, but I find it hard to believe that an entire sector of a manufacturing plant would all have the same terrible shoot-up idea at the same time. Up, back, down, thunk. A large ice cube rattled around the inside of a tumbler as it landed forcefully back on the table. As if on cue, Marissa swiped up a manila folder from its throne of torn envelopes and flung it across the room. Raymu leisurely leaned back and snapped the flying packet out of the air with a rapid wrist motion. You know you can just hand it to me like a normal person, right? And where'd be the fun in that? Raymu began pouring through the dense columns of text printed out before her. Once, twice, thrice. Every last micrometer of writing was scraped and unpacked for its secrets. Growing ever more impatient, Marissa snuffed the end of her cigarette on the face of the desk and drew another from the nearly empty carton before her. She held up an octagonal device to the end and drew in a long breath. Didn't I tell you to open a window if you're going to smoke inside? Raymond's eyes remained glued to the page as he spoke. Fuck you. Do it yourself, coward. Maybe I will. Her smirk was audible, but it stood unrequited. A solemn mask plastered Raymond's face as she continued to scan through the dossier. After a few impossibly long moments of silence, she flicked the folder shut and slammed it back on the table. Marissa raised a single inquisitive eyebrow. So, what do you think? She lowered her cigarette for a brief moment. Raymond's hands swung in wide gestures as she began to explain. It's pinsuits for sure. Bioweapons, attacks on Yasin, manufacturing plants, attacking workers with Anatech augmentations. This is a corporate hit job. Someone wants to damage Yaska, but I can't imagine who or why. The screen flickered again as it switched from Marissa's personal computer to a local radio station. An enthused and robotic voice began reading announcements before being stifled to little more than background noise. It's gotta be Horai, right? I mean, they're like the only megacorp that can compete with New Life. Maybe they're trying to damage the reputation of Anatech or something, you know? Make a bunch of Anatech users sick, pay out some independent journalist to write a hit piece on the so-called dangers of Anatech augmentations tank the stock, and sweep in with their own alternative. Make sense? No, not really. 
If Horai wanted to frame Onatech as being dangerous, they would have just hacked into the cybernetic systems themselves and caused them to malfunction. This is... something else. Horai remains a prime suspect, but if they are behind this, it must be for different reasons. Marissa's face scrunched up into a sour wrinkle. With a single long drag, she fizzled off her cigarette and dropped it onto the ever-full ceramic tray between them. Whatever, you're the eyes. I'll just let you do your thing. Can't imagine this job will be any danger, so I'm just going to take my own and leave this one to you. Got my heart set on a takedown job in the tunnels. Phew, huge gang of credits for this one. Oh, sure, a job. That's the only reason someone like you would be in the tunnels, right? Raymu narrowed her eyes and glanced up for a moment with a disgusted look on her face. Marissa's toothy grin and droopy eyes spoke volumes about the hedonistic thoughts in her mind. What can I say? I go to the tunnels, I check out the holes. I'm a woman of simple taste, Ramu. Ugh. Just send the confirmation to Syra. I'm taking the pinsuit job. I'll be back in a few hours. Marissa chuckled in response, but then her smile faded. If you run into any trouble, any at all, radio me. I'm serious, I'll be there. An uncomfortable silence settled over the room as Ramu stood up. In a single brisk motion, she was off the couch, slipping into a jacket, and jogging out into the streetlights. A city buried thousands of meters below the Earth's surface might be surprising to many. A surprise to many more would be how often it rained. Nearly five days a week, Deep City was drenched in torrential downpours of acidic and polluted rain. But nonetheless, it happened. The progress of science has allowed mankind to dominate every creature on Earth, but even now, it has not overcome the flood. So rather than allowing the waters of Earth to fill the entire caverns, Deep City authorities distribute the water evenly across all districts through drains in the cave ceiling. They call it groundwater redistribution, but to the layman, it's cold, it's wet, and it falls from the sky. It's rain. The light puffs of fog from Raymu's breath were barely visible through the industrial smog that gripped the throats of the lower districts. The rhythm of her footfalls, timed with her rising heartbeat, flowed into a percussive beat in her temples down through covered walkways, bridges, and ramps. The rainwater rinsed the sweat from her forehead and eyes. Upon reaching a familiar handrail, where most would have turned into a garage or bus stop, Raymu took an unexpected turn. Planting her hands firmly atop the cold steel bar, she vaulted her legs laterally into the air. With an agile twist, her entire body had cleared the rail, and she began to fall. No more than three meters lower, her outstretched hands clutched another rail. Like a creature of the trees, Raymu navigated the dense concrete jungle through leaps, slides, swings, and clambers. Calloused palms gripped onto the abrasive sandy texture of the walls. Her body flows through narrows that compose the imposing rows of windows that enclose the street's shadows. Within minutes, Raymu had traversed several streets and alleyways on all axes of movement. Before long, she landed on a scaffold platform and emerged from the dark alleyway into a bustling boulevard. Heart rate elevated. A digital voice rang out from her wrist. For a moment, Raymu stopped and let her senses absorb the world around her. Blinding lights soar in every direction. Swarms of flying machines buzz around each other with pinpoint precision. Plasma banners covering thousands of square meters flash in brilliant colors. Pixels assemble images and images flow into tantalizing scenery that all pull at the mind with a thousand invisible strings. Even those who have lived in Deep City for years couldn't help but rest their eyes on the mind-blazing display of its electric tapestry. But even in the face of the city's hypnotizing gaze, Raymu didn't stop for long. Once the flame in her chest had subsided, a beat from her wrist notified her that her heart rate had normalized. With that cue, she rounded the corner of the skyscraper she clung to and continued on her run. The Cliff District is a place that every resident wishes to avoid, but many do not have the luxury of doing so. The Shrine District is the city's mind, the Power District is the heart, and the Cliffs are the intestines. Assembly plants owned by Yaska Industries are built into the vertical cave walls here. Materials are hauled in, deconstructed, and reconstructed into every possession mankind could imagine. Technology, infrastructure, everything imaginable is assembled here. Whatever is left over is dumped off of a great cliff and into the city's waste system. It is here that the aspirations of the masses are crushed by the looming specter of rent. For humans and yokai alike, this is the blue collar's final destination. Hopefully, for Reimu, it would also be her investigation's final destination. With another familiar tip-tap of footsteps, Raymu had maneuvered herself into a fire escape clinging to the side of the factory. A few slow and calculated drops, and she had descended into a perching position. From the railing upon which she crouched, she could see the bottom of the cliffs far below, and several street tunnels cutting through the cliff base between two wings of the assembly plant. She relaxed for a moment and focused on the feeling of the rising hot air around her. 
Still drenched from the rain, she shivered at the rays and temperature. As she reclined into a more comfortable position, Raymu slipped a plastic bead into her ear and tuned into a local radio station. Time slowed to a near crawl as she lazily watched the streets below. Minutes, or perhaps hours later, Raymu snapped out of her daze at the sound of car doors slamming shut. She turned to face a small alley behind her. An unremarkable white van had been parked sideways, and several masked figures toting rifles stepped out and began scanning the perimeter with flashlights. Raymu instinctively ducked out of the way as a beam passed just above her perch. She focused her mind and tuned into the conversation. I know I fucking saw that demon here. That thing got Satoshi last week. I know I saw it. Shush! It can hear you! They continued their sweep for a few silent moments before a horrific scream pierced the air. Three flashlights turned to face the source, only to catch a blur of unnatural motion seizing the figure at the rear. In an instant, he was gone, leaving only his gun clattering loudly on the asphalt. The remaining figures desperately swept the concrete walls around them looking for the aggressor, but in the permanent darkness of the cave tunnel, nothing could be seen. Raymu's heart began to pound, though not from fear. She was nearly giddy. This was an extermination job. Raymu pressed her ear to the cave wall and closed her eyes. Whatever it was, it was close. She could hear the muffled struggling of the masked figure against... something. Dull thuds of boots kicking against concrete could be heard from near the roof of the tunnel. With a quick breath, Raymu flattened herself to the side of the building and began climbing upwards. A mix of darkness and adrenaline dilated her pupils, and she began to see monochromatic shapes and silhouettes as she ascended. As she neared the top, she turned to scan the darkness. Her eyes narrowed on some flicker of movement, though it was unrecognizable. It appeared as a great mass of many body parts convulsing and struggling against themselves. As she stared at it, it stopped moving, and eight luminescent yellow lights gently glowed at the end of the shadow. Raymu stopped breathing and stood as still as possible on the cave wall. After a few agonizing seconds, the shape convulsed, and the silhouette of a person dropped from its grasp and fell to the floor with a visceral crunch. Shouts echoed out as the remaining figures rushed back to their vehicle, body in tow. Raymu looked back at the yellow lights, which quickly turned away and began to race down the opposite cave wall towards the van. With a sudden realization, Raymu rapidly dropped from her perch and began racing towards the vehicle. She gripped onto a metal railway and flung herself outwards into the center of the alleyway, just as the shadow crawled onto the top of the vehicle. The two collided with a thud, flattening them both into a fresh dent on the fan roof. With a squeal of tires and a sudden jolt of momentum, the two were dragged out of the tunnel and into a swarm of traffic. Now at highway speeds, Raymu ducked her head and wrapped her arms around the shadow to prevent herself from falling. With the aid of the streetlights, she could now properly eye her opponent. Flattened below her was a short and slender woman clad in heavy padded clothing. Around her hips, bulky mechanics whizzed around, seemingly puppeteering the four spidery robotic limbs extending from her lower back. Raymu's eyes landed on the most striking feature, a pair of goggles bearing eight amber eyes. After a split second of scanning, she was interrupted by a shrill and distinctly girlish voice. Get the hell off of me! Raymu recoiled as the cybernetic limbs stabbed between the two bodies in an attempt to fling the shrine maiden into the steel stampede around them. In quick response, she snagged her forearm around the girl's shoulder, locking their bodies into a claustrophobic grapple. From the bottom of the girl's mask, a pair of fang-like syringes unfolded and began wildly stabbing at the air near Raymu's neck. The shrine maiden began to sweat, as she retrieved a metallic handle from her belt. In an instant, the handle extended into a meter-long rod crackling with sky-blue lightning. Both felt their hair rise in the electrified air. A mere instant before her neck could be punctured, Raymu wedged the prod between the two fangs, fragmenting them in a flash of electricity. The girl tore off her broken mask with her free cybernetic arms, and for the first time, Raymu made eye contact. Golden hair, round brown eyes, and an unmistakable velvet bow. Remember me, Shrine Maiden? It's been a while. Yamame! The arachnid girl let out a cackle. Nice to see you again. Now let's wrap this up. With a mechanical snap, a single robotic arm released Raymu and wrapped around the other side of the van. Raymu heard shattering glass and screaming as the vehicle swerved to the side, slamming into the rail and sending both hijackers hurtling over the edge. They fell for several meters before crashing into the thin aluminum roof of the building below. Raymu struggled to breathe. The air was pressed from her lungs and the darkness felt suffocating. Her hands flailed aimlessly, searching for a handhold to orient herself with. With every movement, a terrible jolt of pain erupted in her right shoulder. Eventually, her crawling hand landed on... Eventually, her crawling hand landed upon the edge of a cold metal shelf, and she shakily pulled herself upright. The static in the corners of her vision subsided as the blood began to flow away from her head. By now, her eyes had once again adjusted to the darkness, 
and she could ascertain her location. She was on the top shelf of a warehouse, surrounded by cardboard boxes. Before long, Yamame's voice echoed through the crammed building. I'm here, Shrine Maiden. Reimu's eyes darted frantically around the darkness to no avail. The voice seemed to hound her from every angle at once. A metallic skittering sound pricked at her ears. She struggled to think clearly despite her pounding temples. Don't worry, I don't want to hurt you. You're not on my list. You just got in the way is all. In fact, I think you're quite lovely. Yamame's voice dripped with honey. If you took a moment to think over your actions, I think you would understand where I'm coming from a bit better. Tell me, then, Reimu responded between deep breaths. Those workers, what crime did they commit for you to hunt them down like this? A short questioning silence was broken by a terse answer. I'm not hunting them. They'll be fine. I just gave them the flu. Every one of them will be back to work soon, but not before Yasuka bleeds out a million bucks. Reimu continued to drag herself along the shelf, desperately looking for an exit. Reimu continued to drag herself along the shelf, scanning desperately for an exit. With the right arm out of order, dropping directly to the floor wasn't an option. Through labored breath, she called back out into the darkness. Spelling the details so easily. I'm sure your commis ah, commissioner wouldn't like that. Nobody's paying me. Yamame's voice quickly erupted into furious screaming. I don't work for those goddamn pin suits. I just want Yasuka and Anatek to pay for what they did to me. And if the courts won't make them do it, I will. The clatter of her cybernetic limbs crescendoed. For a brief moment, Reimu locked her eyes shut and focused all of her attention on the vibrations of the shelves around her. She felt the wave of movements and sounds wash over her before narrowing them down to a direction. And in the split second that they paused, she snapped and turned to face her opponent. As soon as the two made eye contact, Yamame pounced off of the wall and directly onto Reimu. Her spidery limbs pierced into the surrounding cargo and anchored her in place. With a crazed look in her eyes, Yamame dug her thumbs directly into Reimu's neck and continued to scream. Look at me! I'm a freak! Her cybernetics twitched and shivered, shaking the thin shelves supporting them. I just needed some extra money! I didn't want to be Anatech's fucking cyborg lab rat! I can't even get the damn thing taken out! Now I can't work for Yasuka, I can't work for Anatech, and nobody wants to hire me because of this. Reimu's forearms quivered as she fought to keep her airways open. So, that's it then. You got, you got Anatech arms, Yasuka fired you, and now you're trying to wreck the whole company? Even in the complete darkness, Yamame's golden eyes and ivory fangs were as clear as day. She leveraged herself against the ceiling and pressed her thumbs down even harder. Tears welled in her eyes as she spoke. Why did you have to get involved? I was going to quit soon anyways. I don't want money or violence. I just want Yasuka to stop treating us yokai like animals. Is that so much to ask for in this city? Reimu felt the grasp around her begin to loosen. She slowly took one hand down and moved it towards her belt. You, you don't have... You don't have to do this. Yamame, come on. I can help you. I know people. We can start over. Yame's eyes widened. You, you can? You think someone will hire me? I don't want to be a punk. I, I just need the money. Do you think you can... <laughs> Rimu's ears were pierced by a blood-chilling scream mixed with the hair-raising crackle of a taser prod. She pushed the end of her prod deep into Yamame's armpit and continued to send the waves of lightning through the girl's light body. Yamame convulsed and her cybernetic limbs withered. After a second... Reimu retracted the prod, and the sounds died off. She uncurled the prosthetics that clutched her waist and slowly began to climb down the shelf. As she stepped onto the ground, she looked back up to the unconscious girl left there. For a moment, she just stared numbly. Then, as the pain in her body reminded her, she began to limp towards the exit. She raised a trembling hand to her cheek and whispered into her wrist, Requesting cleanup. At current coordinates. We'll file report. Upon arrival. Over. Boarding public transport with open wounds is ill-advised. At best, you'll receive sideways glances and maybe one or two security officers wanting to play 20 questions. At worst, a pair of thugs might smell the blood. But without the use of her arms, Reimu had no choice but to weave into the fold with the rest of the sheet. The light rail could get her out of the district, and from there the omnivators could take her down to the level of her apartment. The transit is, by far, the fastest way to get around Deep City. The cameras mounted every ten feet made Reimu's neck itch. 
At least she wouldn't have to deal with it for any more than precisely 14 minutes and 36 seconds. Raymu fumbled with her keys. Unlocking a door with her non-dominant hand was exacting enough already, without the trembling, exhausted muscles. It wouldn't have been nearly as much of a task if Nitori hadn't replaced the maglock with a deadbolt for, quote, security reasons, unquote. After a few seconds of shaking and clattering against the cold steel, Raymu dropped her keys and slammed her left fist against the door twice. If Nitori was wired, she wouldn't be able to hear a thing. But if Marissa was home, there was a chance that she would hear the knock over her mind-numbingly loud music. As if by a miracle, the knock was answered by a muffled and barely audible voice from inside. Forget your keys again? Fuck's sake, give me a second. A few moments later, the door swung open to a slouching and ragged Marissa. Hey, girl. The fuck? What happened to you? Her giddy half-grin melted away in an instant as Raymu stumbled through the doorway, nearly causing a collision. Marissa stepped under Raymu's arm to form a shoulder crutch. Hold on, let's get you to bed. Take it easy, not too fast. Damn it, I told you not to take a dangerous job without me. Raymu tried to speak in response, but all that came out was the labored groans at the sudden movements. When she finally made it to the bed in the center of the apartment, her body gave out and she flopped onto her back on the hard foam mattress. She tried to speak again, and this time she managed to stumble out a few words. Shoulder. Set it. For a few seconds, Marissa looked up and down her friend before nodding. She gingerly wrapped her fingers around Raymu's triceps and ran her hands across her shoulder blades. Sorry, girl. This is gonna hurt. Oh, you drink afterwards. She planted a foot against the side of the bed, took a deep breath, and yanked back hard. With a visceral, meaty pop, Raymu's shoulder snapped back into its natural position. Ah! She yelped and rolled over onto her side, her heart pounding in her throat. She wanted to scream, but found herself unable. I'll, I'll get something for that shoulder. Just give me a second. Let's see, um, ice. Marissa swiftly stepped towards the kitchen area and filled a plastic bag with ice cubes. She tied it off and poured an ounce of whiskey into a short glass. I don't think we have pain pills. I haven't stocked them since I got my dialer. Anything else you need? Just whiskey is fine. Marissa returned in a moment with her makeshift medications. She gently raised Raymu's head upright and lifted the glass to her lips. Raymu's face scrunched up as she slowly sipped the sharp spirits. After finishing the bitter drink, the shrine maiden leaned back into her thin cushions and let out a held-in breath. Marissa's compassionate tone quickly escalated into scolding. I told you not to go out into danger by yourself. I told you to radio me if you ran into anything. And what did you do? Played the hero as usual. Now look at what you've done. Raymu narrowed her eyes. I didn't think I'd need you. Things went unexpectedly. I would have been fine otherwise. Her words dripped with sarcastic venom. Oh, really? You think you're so tough that you don't need me to fight off punks and cops alike? Well then, I never should have offered. Clearly you don't need me. Marissa's words picked up speed. Heart rate elevated. Raymu struggled to keep her cold exterior against the dead giveaway on her wrist. I'm not going to call you every time I run into a job with more than an ounce of effort. You could have been killed! Marissa's yells heightened into desperate screams. You need to take a fucking moment to think about what could have happened. What if the suspect was armed? What if you ran into cops? You need to stop acting like a fucking hero and tell the rest of us when you need help. You got that? Her knuckles bawled and crackled, but the moment she saw tears welling in Marissa's eyes, a wave of shame washed over Raymu. I'm... I'm sorry. I should have called you. I just wanted to see for myself if I still had it in me. Raymu's words came out slow and measured. Marissa's eyes widened, and she quickly leaned into Raymu for a tight embrace. You don't have to prove it. You don't have to prove it to me, and you don't have to prove it to yourself or anyone else. I just want you to be okay. You got that? Raymu basked for a moment in the warmth of her friend's arms. She started to respond, but held her tongue. After a few moments of silence, she started again. I'm the Shrine Maiden. It's my job to exterminate yokai. And even decades after the fall of Gensokyo, I still see it as my job. So no matter what happens, I have to keep doing that. It's the only thing I know. No, you don't have to. You just have to live. In this fucked up world, you just have to live. For me, for Nitori, and for everyone else that knows and loves you. Just promise me that you'll do that, alright? Try as she might, Marissa could not control her trembling. Oh, I'll try. A dreadfully long silence hung in the air. Heart rate normalized. 
I miss Gensokyo, Raymond finally continued. I do too. I guess we'll just have to make the best of the new world, right? Every word Marissa spoke was a shaky lie, both to herself and to her friend. Maybe. I guess we'll never know until it's all over. Well, solving the questions of life isn't really my strong suit. But what I am good at is muscle relaxation. Now turn over so I can take a look at that shoulder of yours. Raymu smirked devilishly. You're not a doctor. Care to explain where you learned to become a physical therapist? Marissa chuckled in response. I could go with the easy answer and say I have a lot of experience touching women, but leaving the question unanswered is way funnier to me. Huh. At least treat me with a bit of respect. I'm not one of your paid actors. Raymu's words carried a scolding tone, but she couldn't keep back an honest smile. Within a few hours, Raymu had cleaned up and retired for the evening on the sofa. The mind-numbing drone of the evening television was never more welcome. What was it now? The news? Too political. Public broadcast? A bit too juvenile. A show about loggers constructing homes in the harsh Siberian wilderness? Perfection. From her view on the couch, Raymu could see the hastily raised curtains that sectioned off Nitori's office from the rest of the apartment. From the blue ambient lights peeking through, Raymu could guess that Nitori was wired. Though even without those clues, at any given time, it was about a two-to-one chance that she was. Did the girl even eat? Judging by her pudgy exterior and the mounds of noodle boxes piling atop her desk, one would have to guess so, even with no non-circumstantial evidence. As the drone of the television faded into indistinct noise, Raymu's mind turned inwards. She thought about herself, and she thought about how much the world has changed since the fall. In so many ways, the world was completely different. She was forced to adapt to new technology and carve out her place in a societal structure of billions of others all ranked by wealth. However, in many ways, the world is the same as it always has been. The gods still fight for notoriety and worship, albeit through billboards and brand deals. Marissa's still her brutish and reckless self, although now her studies have been focused more on working her spells into electronic devices. Nitori is as shy as ever, but instead of slinking away into her kappa cabal, she instead sends her mind down digital riverways into the infinite ocean that is the internet. And as for herself, well, Raymu still gets to do some of the things she loved to do. Instead of a shrine, she was confined to caring for a dingy office space inside of her apartment. Rather than bringing in prayers, she focused on bringing in credit wires from employers and anonymous donors. That night, Raymu spent a lot of time thinking about Marissa's words. Make the best of the new world. She let out a huff as she thought out loud. It doesn't seem as though the world wants to make the best out of me. As she pondered over the deeper meaning of these words, exhaustion took her, and she drifted into a deep sleep. Dreams overcame her, the last bastion of unpolluted magic left in this world. For only her dreams carried the power to release her from the oppressive and pervasive clutches of modern society. Only dreams could return her to the land of fantasy she once knew.